Hello everybody. So, thank you for tuning in. Today we're going to look over uh, a little bit of propaganda. Uh, my brother sent this to me because he knows I love watching things that make me angry. Love you, bud. Uh, but uh, it's from a channel called Policy Ed. Let's go ahead and see what the fuck they're talking about. In 2021, U.S. leaders will face a confounding and wretched situation in the greater Middle East. So, real fast, H.R. McMaster, when I first pulled this video up, my brother sent it to me, I had to look him up real fast because I was like, that name sounds very familiar. And it's the guy that led Operation Iraqi Freedom. He, um, and uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. Well, didn't lead, that's hard to, you can't say that, but... You know, he was he was a huge component of these uh, wars of aggression uh, in this region. You know, he's instrumental. So, uh, and of course, he's a national security advisor for Donald Trump, you know. But, yeah. Let's keep going. The policies of the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations have been consistent with America's tendency to engage the region episodically <clears throat> and pursue short-term solutions to long-term problems. <laughs> As the American experience in Iraq has demonstrated, treating symptoms rather than causes of violence perpetuates conflict and magnifies threats to national and international security. This is such a vague, so you're treating symptoms, right? So like, I'm assuming the symptoms he's referring to are what? Uh, like ISIS existing? Like like uh, terrorist cells in the region? Is that a, a symptom? Such vague language. The United States and its like-minded partners in the Middle East must focus on ending the sectarian civil war that is at the root of the humanitarian crisis and the threats that emanate from the region. Well, sectarian civil war? Okay, so you're saying, okay, 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 okay. So when we went into Iraq, a part of our shock and awe strategy was literally pitting different ethnic groups and religious groups in the region against each other. That was literally a part of our strategy was to stow or to, to stoke the sectarian tensions and divide. We, we would literally arm different groups of people and say they're trying to take your land or, you know, uh, they're working with an enemy country or something like this. Our idea at the time was to fully demotivate, demoralize, destabilize the region, and then we'll just put a democracy in and they'll be uh, respectful. <clears throat> they'll they'll have, be, have been beaten down to such a degree that they will... Like, listen to what we say. Be an ally. And he was a part of this strategy. So, to say now that we need to, you know, solve the sectarian divide, we're the reason that divide exists to the degree that it does today. I mean, this divide is, has existed for a long time. Like, there's no denying that. But it's imperial powers that have made this divide much more of an issue. Like, the whole reason why there's three huge uh, ethnic slash religious groups uh, in Iraq, you know, uh, the Kurds, Sunnis, and the Shia, uh, was because Iraq didn't exist. It was created by the British um, Empire. And it was literally designed, or the borders were drawn around resources that the British Empire wanted. You know? And then when the country actually left... To, you know, become an independent nation, they just kept the borders, obviously. So, like, the like the, the whole uh, movement right now that has come up with um, the uh, wanting a, a Kurdish state comes from the fact that the Kurds, their ancestral lands are in three different countries. Syria, Turkey, and Iraq. So, I, it's just... This, this is insane to me that he is, is, of all people, saying that we need to solve this divide. As if talking about it in, to such a degree that, like, 
Is it like he had nothing to do with it? You know, and I I just blows my mind. I mean, he's saying it with like he's saying it like a fucking motivational speaker at a high school gym too, and that kind of blase attitudes kind of blow my mind. To succeed, those efforts must be executed at a cost acceptable to the American people. The American people don't want any more war. Except, across the political spectrum, many Americans now believe that withdrawing from the region would not only reduce the costs, but also improve U.S. security. 100%. But there are three reasons why disengagement would make a bad situation worse. All right, hit me, McMaster. First, problems in the region do not remain confined there. Today's jihadist terrorist organizations are orders of magnitude larger than the Mujahideen alumni from the Soviet-Afghan war that perpetrated 9-11. But 9-11 didn't happen in a vacuum. 9-11 was a direct response to our involvement in Iraq with the first with the first war in the 90s. It's, it's a direct involvement of us having troops in Saudi Arabia. The great devil on holy land, as they would consider it. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, they were fucking religious fanatics. Okay? Like, you, you don't hijack a plane and dr drive it into a goddamn building because you have a policy disagreement. Okay? You, you are insane. But... The reason why that insanity was so motivated and partially funded by the Saudi government, by the way, our allies in the region, <clears throat> is because, or the Saudi royal family. Well, I guess the Saudi royal family is the Saudi government. So, but anyways, is because we were uh, being uh, so aggressive in the region in uh, forcing people to work with us so that we could have access to resources. And so we can have access to uh, areas to put military bases for, you know, uh, pure military strategy in, in maintaining uh, the American hegemonic order, uh, American-derived hegemonic order of the world as it exists today. So it's not like, like, don't get me wrong, it's definitely true that um, when ISIS was at their peak, they were able to draw people in from, like, around the world, a lot of Westerners even. Uh, and that is because of, you know, things like Twitter and the Internet in general, you know, social media. And they were able to spread their reach further than uh, the Mujahideen would have ever been able to. However, that motivation derives from our involvement in the region. Like, ISIS primarily was founded by Ba'athist generals. And those Ba'athist generals and upper, upper echelon of the officers and such of the Iraqi army uh, were excommunicated deliberately by uh, uh, the American military uh, when whenever we actually took over the region because we felt like we needed a clean slate in order to actually get Iraq off to a good start, even though we couldn't even get like running water and power consistently for months and months and months and months, whereas Saddam could. So th the idea that we would know better is insane to me. And it, this is a this right here is straight up colonial mindset. Oh, look at this problem. Let's not look at what we did in our involvement in this problem, but let's look at this problem. How can we fix it since these people can't? Insane thinking. Can you imagine if, like, there was a a Middle Eastern coalition that formed somehow? They solved all their sectarian divides and they became just like the Middle Eastern states of of you know Asia or whatever of Asia and Africa, and this country is like, you know, America, you got a hardcore problem with in institutional racism. You can't seem to solve it on your own, and they just straight up fucking invaded us, or at least tried to, to fix us, to solve our problems. Come on, this is insane. Their reach and destructive capabilities are growing. And so must our and partner efforts to dismantle them. Second, the costs of inaction in the region are often higher than the costs of action. 
Oh yeah. The 2003 invasion of Iraq may have been ill considered. <laughs> oh yeah. It may have been ill considered, huh? Ah, that's a way of putting it. But so was the 2011 withdrawal from Iraq. A small contingent of troops and a commitment to help keep the peace would have prevented the rise of ISIS. But that's not true. ISIS arose specifically because we meddled in the region. If we had not invaded Iraq, there would be no ISIS today. It's that simple. Well, maybe, you know, not that simple. Maybe there would be some kind of offshoot, but they wouldn't have the ability to take over oil refineries and, like, legit operate as a fucking country for a little bit. Like, that would not have happened. The idea that us leaving is the reason for ISIS and not us entering is completely not accepting your role, McMaster, in destroying this region, murdering innocent people, and giving rise to fanatics. When you, like, see, fanatics always exist in any society everywhere, right? But when you came in, you gave people who would not ever listen to these fanatics a reason to listen to them. Because you killed loved ones. You destroyed infrastructure. You destroyed historical sites. You destabilized the government. You made it to where it was hard to get access to food, water, shelter. There are horror stories that come from our invasion of Iraq. Straight up war crimes were committed. And all the people involved, by the way, get off scot-free because they're American politicians. And they can get away with murder. They can just blame it on bad intel, and then it's all good. This is disgusting. And the fact that um, he thinks that somehow like further entrenching ourselves in the region is the solution that we need to think ourselves around is funny to me because we've, we've already built massive military bases there, right? We, we still, you know, do drone strikes and all that kind of stuff there. Uh, we literally just last year murdered a top-ranking Iranian official because he was in the region, even though he was one of the main reasons why ISIS got pushed back so hard. This is insane to me. The devastation it caused. Third, the United States is not the only major player engaged in the Middle East. Russia... China and Iran all have their own vision for the region and none of them are compatible with the interests or values of the United States. Okay, don't start with me right now on the interests or values of the United States, okay? Like, name the successful puppet regions, uh, puppet countries and regions around the world that are like allies to the United States or do what the United States wants and agree with our values that treat their people good. There was just an uprising recently in Haiti. We've been involved heavily in coups and destabilization in Latin America for the better part of the last 120, 130 years. There is such a populist rise against the United States in the majority of Latin American countries. It is crazy to me that people still even believe this shit. Like, the engagement on this video is a little weird because it has 200,000 views. But 31 likes, 13 dislikes, and one comment. That's a little weird. So I wonder where this is like, I wonder where this is being shown at to where it's getting so many views. But yeah. For example, keep going. Russia and Iran aid, abet, and sustain the murderous Assad regime in Syria. Yeah, but we aided and abetted and sustained Saddam before it was useful to go against him. We aid, abet, and sustain the House of Saud. 
we ate a bet and sustained the uh, 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 leader and uh, Muammar Gaddafi before it was useful. Uh, uh, before he wasn't useful anymore. We aid, abet, and sustain dictators across the world all of the time. This is not a reason to involve ourselves. Iran threatens Israel and its Arab neighbors as it seeks hegemonic influence through the use of proxy forces to fuel sectarian civil wars. But Israel does that too. Which in turn... Generates and we do that support for jihadist terrorists, but we give them support too by giving them a fucking enemy. If we keep showing up saying, "Hey, we're gonna take your shit," <laughs> it gives the common people a reason to look at the crazy person, to go to the person that is an extreme, an extremist. That person that's an extremist starts to make sense. Russia uses the chaos in the region to extend its influence, allying with Iran, drawing Turkey further away from the West, weaponizing refugees to weaken Europe. Whoa! Okay, so he's perpetuating the narrative that refugees are causing violence by saying that. Weaponizing refugees. I want to literally look that term up. I've never, I've never heard that. Weaponizing. Hang on, hang on. I can't spell. Weaponizing refugees. What does that mean? Greece is weaponizing the coronavirus against... No, no. What's the FDD? What is that? Foundation for Defense of Democracies? German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Willkommenskulter. Welcome culture of last year has screeched to a grinding halt, delivering an early December speech to Christian Democrats in the convention, in which she reelected as the party's leader and candidate in the next national election with nearly 90 percent of the votes. She declared a situation like the one in the last summer of 2015 cannot, should not, and must not be repeated. Merkel, in a move to placate critics of radical Islam, called for a ban of full veil. Interesting, I didn't know that. Her motivation in trying to outlaw is that true? Did she call for a ban? Is that true? Europe is weird about that stuff. That, that sh this shit would never fly in America. You can't ban people's religious expression. Oh, damn, that is true. Interesting, because I know, like, in France, they hate that shit. Islam belongs in Germany. It's largest to friend. Okay, so this is just her trying to win an election. But what is that? Oh, so when he's saying weaponizing refugees, he's referring to trying to win an election by appealing to right-wing people in the country. But he's justifying it. <laughs> uh Fucking, what is this? Whenever you say you're a defense of democracy, I'm immediately skeptical of you. In-depth research. Strengthening U.S. national security. Yeah. And presenting itself as an indispensable power broker that can ameliorate problems it is helping to create. As a but wait, but you, that's what we're doing. Okay, that's literally what he's doing in this video right here. He's saying that Russia uh, and Iran are basically saying, are causing chaos and then saying, hey, we can fix the chaos. But, like, we did that. We caused chaos in the region, and now he's saying we have to stay and continue to uh, more deeply involve ourselves to solve this crisis that exists in the area. A crisis, by the way, that has nothing to do with our involvement, I guess. Come on. Which Hoover Institution scholar Fawad Ajami observed about the Middle East... It is not a fast part of the world. Progress in breaking the cycle of sectarian violence and overcoming the region's problems will be slow and uneven. But withdrawing from... What kind of racist bullshit is this? 
it is not a fast part of the world. So, the Middle East had some very strong and lively up-and-coming democracies coming into the 20th century, especially as they were coming out of uh, colonialism, because it, it was a colonized region, you know, for centuries. Um, by by a number of different empires, you know, not just the British or the French, you know, but even like the Ottomans could arguably be considered a colonial power. Um, and the thing is, is like this region did have a lot of uh, democracies that were coming out, uh, most notably Iran. And uh, what happened there? <laughs> okay, like you know, uh, Mohammed Mossadegh uh, was elected with the idea of nationalizing their oil industry, and we fucking killed him. Americans killed him. We propped up the House of Saud, which is the largest progenitor of the Wahhabist form of Sunni Islam, which is where a lot of these extremists uh, base their ideas around. They themselves sponsor terrorism, uh, implicitly and explicitly. Dude, they're committing a genocide in Yemen right now. And we're supporting them. Although, you know, kudos to Biden, he did stop um, uh, uh, the majority of weapons deals to the country in, in response to that, which is a good thing, you know. I feel like you can go a little harder, but honestly, that's more than I thought he would do, so. Um, but yeah, like, it, it's just, this is, this is insane. <laughs> the Middle East will be slow and uneven. Racist but bullshit. But withdrawing from the Middle East would neither conciliate the region's violent passions nor insulate America from them. While recognizing the... I don't... I mean, I guess that's not necessarily wrong, but the thing is, is we're the fucking evil empire here. So yeah, it's true that we're not, like, free from consequences. I mean, that's true. But the thing is, is, like, there are consequences for these kind of actions. You know, to take it on a smaller scale, historical example here, the Confederate States of America had uh, upheld uh, an institution of slavery and were uh, antagonistic toward the Union, right? What's the consequence of that shit? Well, first of all, you're breaking away from the Union, which the Union did not think was legitimate. And then on top of that, it's the main reason you're breaking away is to maintain an institution. The majority of Americans outside of the con Confederate areas, the southern states, didn't like, didn't agree with. Didn't want to do. Even if they were racist, they didn't like slavery. And didn't agree with it and wanted it abolished. So, when you, when you do things, there are responses to that. And even in recent present day history, that's a little bit more prescient to this here, not some historical example, with 9-11. Just talked about it, you know, 20 minutes ago or whatever in, in the video here. When you had... Those actions in the Middle East, the war that we did, the killing that we did, where it was something like, I think the, av the, 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 the average estimate or something is like 50 to 100,000 kids were killed. I know uh, Iraq said like 500,000 kids, but to my understanding, those numbers are exaggerated. But yeah, like around 100K kids were killed in our bombing campaigns. I mean, that strikes fucking anger in the heart of so many people. And so much pain that we caused. And why? Geopolitical influence and access to oil. Insane. Can't see past that, right? But uh. Limits of its influence in the region. The United States cannot afford to disengage. Sure we can. Leaders must make the case to the American people that sustained engagement is critical to their future security and prosperity this is an interesting you know i'm done with this video so this is this is an interesting uh dynamic though that we exist in right now we've been in these wars for so long that the rage and initial anger over being involved in this area it's 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 like normalized now like like it's or, or the rage is dissipated and so now like there are kids right now that get deployed over there that were born when these wars began. You know, the war in Iraq is coming up on its 20th birthday. 
And, uh, you know, back in, like, you know, the elections in 2004, 2006, 2008, uh, and even 2010 to some degree, um, these wars were a, a hotbed issue because they were fresh. But now we've been there for so long that this man can unironically say we need to have a sustained engagement and not be a la- and not be a laughingstock. This is someone who had a position of power as recently as like 20, what was it, 2017? 2018, 2017 to 2018. That, that, that is insane to me. 2017, 2018, right there. That is insane to me. So, I mean, that's embarrassing. Uh, this is America, baby. This is how we do it. We just push these wars and have no action plan, figure it out later, cause a whole bunch of problems and say, hey, look at all these problems. No, we can't leave now. Now, I definitely agree. Like, you can't just leave. You know, now we're too far in it. But, like, I actually think that we actually have a moral obligation to work with the global community, like, through the UN uh, and let the people of the region have self-determination, even if that means they fucking hate us. And frankly, it like I, uh, Iraq um, last year voted against us, I think two times. I know once for sure, but I think it was twice. Voted against us being in the region. They wanted us to leave. And we need to respect that. If we give a fuck about sovereignty, we need to respect that. If that means they end up being allies with Iran or with... Uh, Russia or with China, then that's our fuck up. Like if you walk into a house party, crash the place, trash the furniture, eat all the food, and then fucking tell everyone to go fuck themselves while you're there. And then the, the, the host of the party is like, dude, you need to get the fuck out. All right. These guys here are being cool. You're being a dick. You can't be like, well, you can't have me leave now. Cause then you won't be my friend. You'll be their friends. <laughs> this is, this is childish thinking. This man had power. That's upsetting. Well, thank you again, my brother, for sharing this to me and pissing me off. Love you, bud. Um, If you like the video, like it. Dislike it if you don't. Leave a comment if you got something to say. Maybe I got something wrong. Fucking learn me. I love learning. Um, And, of course, hit that subscribe button if you want to. Um, Yeah, hope you have yourself an awesome rest of your day, night. I hope you drank water today. That's important. And uh, yeah, eat less carbs. Have a good one.